Hello, this is Mad Cat, and welcome to another edition of Boobs and Dicks Smash the Matriarchy. As you can see, Boobs is not here at the moment, but she'll be joining us along shortly. Uh, now, this is a special treat because I know a few people have been asking me to do my shows later, and that's not always feasible, but today we get to do that. So hopefully some of the people who can't make my regular shows can make it today. We have a very special show today. Uh, we have returning guests Elizabeth Hobson and Steve Moxon. They were on our show about a month ago discussing Steve's book, which required me to take an advanced level course just to understand the forward. <laughs> but it was a great book on sex differences that is a much needed book um, in our society right now and a good read it's a little difficult read but it is a good read on the actual truth of genders so joining us today is elizabeth how are you doing i'm doing good and how are you doing steve pretty well indeed thanks so for the people who may not have seen our last show can you go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself starting with you steve uh, I'm Steve Mox, and I'm the author of a book called The Woman Racket, uh, back in 2008. Most recently, as you just said in the introduction, uh, a book about sex difference, um, which is open access at the New Male Studies Journal, or you can buy it from Amazon. My interest is in the biological roots of human sociality, human social behaviour and cognition, and with a particular interest in the sexes. So I'm interested in what makes people and society tick. And you can't understand that without looking at the sexes. And my point, obviously, is the whole idea of social construction and gender is, has got it completely wrong. OK, my turn? Yes. Yeah. I am a stay-at-home mum. I'm also a libertarian anti-feminist. I'm a bit of an activist and I've been working on some videos with Studio Brule, um, which will be released soon on a channel called The Liberty Bells. Not just Liberty Bells. If you go to just Liberty Bells, you'll find some cheerleaders and that's not me and my friends. <laughs> um, and say, yeah, a bit of an activist as well. <laughs> It's true, I do. <clears throat> All right. So, in case you uh, have been living under a rock for the last two years, we have the Red Pill movie that came out in the past October, but before that, it met controversy of almost not being made until a Kickstarter campaign was um, mentioned on Breitbart by Milo Yiannopoulos, and it became a reality. Now, it has um, been played all across the world. I'm not sure if it's been played in Australia yet. I think it has, but it did get banned from two theaters there. Um, I believe it's had some problems in Canada and Germany, but for the most part, we've been able to get this play in several different cities across the world. I even hosted an event myself in Philadelphia, and it was a pretty good showing, I thought. Um, it, it is a wonderful, wonderful film. Um, now, we're talking about this today for two reasons. One, it is now available for purchase. You can now get it on iTunes. I believe you can also get the DVD itself. I was seeing some pre-orders earlier this week. I hope to get it one of these days. But the second reason that we're discussing it today is because Steve Moxon had finally gone out and saw it himself. Um, and as we discussed in our previous episode that we had together, he had mentioned that there was a lot about the men's movement that he wasn't fully aware of. I mean, he knew that it existed in some of their problems, but not really the whole scope of it. And I'm hoping now, you having seen the Red Pill movie, that maybe you have a better appreciation for what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, well, I'm fully aware of the men's movement. Obviously, I've been involved in it. My position has always been that I've, um, I've taken a bit of a back seat from it uh, because it seemed to um, 
my role seems to be better to actually do the uh, cross-disciplinary research to produce material that MRAs could then pick up and use. Uh, and and I would say, um, rather than a men's rights activist, anyway, I'd say, like Elizabeth, I would describe myself uh, as an anti-feminist, particularly. But yeah, I'm aware of all the women's movement stuff. I'm not always necessarily on board with all of it. I mean, I don't uh, like the idea that ABFM does about the humanist angle because it's from humanism that we get Marxism, we get uh, identity politics and the third wave feminism, which caused all this shit in the first place. So it seems to me to come from that same area as the basis for arguing that we should have equality. I can understand where they're coming from that way and appealing in a mainstream way, but ultimately I think it causes philosophical problems. I think it's just simpler to be anti-ideology. Anti I think rather than actually have yourself yourself coming from an ideological position, which humanism is, it's residual Christianity, um, it's best to say, right, okay, well, let's be anti-ideology altogether, and particularly, as Elizabeth says, anti-feminist, uh, and be you know, pro-science, actually, look at, look at what the science says. Uh, then, so that's, that's my position. So it's not that I'm unaware of the men's movement, I'm all too aware I apologize. It. I miss. Yeah. I misspoke on that. No, um, no, 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 you didn't. Because uh, being not firmly involved in it, obviously, there are going to be little, little bits of it that I'm not aware of. Obviously, I'm aware. Of, I'm, I'm from the UK, so I'm in, very much aware and in touch with Mike Buchanan, his political party. Now, me and Mike, uh, we, we we disagree in very friendly terms. Uh, I don't think that's the way forward, particularly. And uh, I think the way forward is 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 legal routes to. You know, even rather than campaigning generally. But going back to the film, I saw the film first time in, in Manchester, UK. Uh, was it two, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? And I thought it was a, a really, really good film. It's a two hour film. It didn't fly get any points. It was, a, I mean, looking back at it, I'm, I'm struggling to remember a, a lot of it, but it was a really quite impressive film. It didn't say anything that I didn't know, obviously, but uh, it would be a real eye opener, I think. Um, as I'm sure Elizabeth will agree, to anybody who doesn't know about these issues. It, it was rep repetitive. It was pushing, particularly the one point it really pushed was about, you know, the 95% of workplace deaths are men. I mean, you know, it's fairly common knowledge, but uh, it did push that. So I, I think it did push things a, a, maybe a bit too repetitively and left a few other things out. But um, of course, the other key thing is the woman uh, presenting it apart from being a thoroughly attractive female, which is a pretty good thing to have in, 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 in a film when you're presenting men's issues. And a, the strongest thing about it was this journey thing. She came from a journey. She started making the film as a fully paid up feminist. And the film was her journey of escaping that and questioning feminism to the point of declaring herself no longer to be a feminist. That was the most powerful thing about the film. Uh, Elizabeth, would you like to react to that before I do absolutely yeah that that was just beautiful to see the um, journey um, and you know I'd sort of like to echo what you're saying really that I think at the moment everybody who's seen it is already red pilled and so nobody's learned anything from it as yet but what we have is a really incredibly powerful tool to red pill the rest of society and you know, Cassie's done the really hard work. It's now down to us in the anti-feminist, MRA, non-feminist community, anyone who cares about men and boys to get it out there, you know? And so we need to be going and saying to all of our friends and family, you've got to do something for me, you know? And it's spend a fiver and watch this film. My, um, sorry, Chris, uh, do you want to come back? Sorry, sorry, you haven't finished. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, we can really change the mainstream consciousness, I think. Chris, you're going to come back up. I was going to have something to say, unless you want to come back, Chris. Well, I was going to say that I agree with you that it is very powerful, um, like you're saying. And, yeah, we do really see her transition from it. And I was just thinking, um, you know, what Bill Maher was saying about, you know, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And I think in this case, it really does start to explain why feminism is so adverse at having a conversation about any of this with any of us. Um, because if this film is so powerful to turn a staunch 
feminists like Cassie J into now questioning feminism, that she no longer calls herself a feminist. She doesn't call herself an MRA, but then neither do I. But um, <coughs> she... <coughs> Feminists have to realize that that is a very real threat. So that's why they have to do everything they can to not let it get the light of day, not to let anyone speak for that reason alone. And that's why they are so militant. So I think... Mike, Go ahead. Uh, my question about it, but um, I, I dare say most people wouldn't agree with me on this. Given that she got this platform, and um, and I, th I thought an excuse in an interview, I thought saying that well, she could have included this, that, and the other, and didn't because of space. So I think in a two-hour film, she could have made space. But um, given you got that platform, I, I was thinking, um, you know, with my biological hat on, obviously, that uh, she, there could have been a lot more hard hitting. Uh, the thing that um, I find difficult to understand, and this is about MRAs, let alone anybody else. Uh, as, as I said in the uh, talk after the film, at, uh, when, when I was on the panel at Manchester, uh, is all the stuff, all the converging lines of evidence, as I discuss in my book, about domestic violence, intimate partner violence, as it's now called, showing that fairly incontrovertibly that uh, the most perpetration is by females. And, and uh, the etiology for it, all the neurohormonal mechanisms, which we now know what they are, uh, and we studied all the behavior and cognition to do with that. We all know that there is uh, that there is such thing as female perpetration. The, the perpetration by male seems not specifically um, DV at all. It, it, it appears to be violence by displacement because men, uh, you know, they've got a deep, deep seated inhibition about being violent, expressing aggression as physical violence towards females in any context. So, given all that, um, I mean, I suppose what I'm saying is you shouldn't have hinged the whole film around that really that is the linchpin uh, of, of destroying the whole feminist argument the whole concept of a dominance or what do you or power when you call it relationship between the sexes the, the fulcrum of that is this idea that men are domestically violent and women aren't or at least women are less so well that is patently false now and if the film could have uh, put that not even central but at least discussed it a bit that would have been that would have been a clincher argument for a lot of people. The, the way the film was, um, it, and it was, as I say, it was very good. Well, I want to just... answer that point before yeah. you um, move on with that, um, because you're right. The film could have been more hard hitting. It could have really dove into the facts more. Really discuss, you know, the inaccuracies of the feminist arguments, and. But I think at the same time, I know what Cassie J was trying to do. She was merely just saying, hey, this exists, these people exist, and this is why they exist. She was trying to cast a wide net to just get the issues out there, to let people hear about sure. the issues. Now, if she were to do a documentary on domestic violence, then I think it would be appropriate to bring that discussion in there. But yeah, it being a two hour film, there's a lot of things that she didn't get a really a chance to discuss or really go into. And she again, didn't go into this. just casting a wide net and just trying to get as much in there as she could yeah. to get but the point to hear about it, to introduce it. This is a gateway film for other people to come along and fill in the gaps that she left. Yeah, but the point is, is that the, the fulcrum of understanding, uh, you know, reverse understanding, inverting feminism into reality is domestic violence. Uh, and she didn't ignore it completely. I think a point in the film, uh, there was the usual thing that, well, you know, men are aggressed against as well sort of thing, which is the Mike McCann's political party line and also our charity in the UK, the Mankind Initiative. Uh, which seems to have partly sold out to feminism, really, and it goes along with the headline stat that one in three DV victims are male, which is, you know, it's a lie because males under-report compared to females. Sex difference is roughly a factor of 10, an order of magnitude. But I don't see why. Uh, well, I, I understand why she didn't include it, because I think what she was, I imagine what she was avoiding were things which people say, oh, that that's an unbelievable factoid 
you know, we are dismissing the rest of the film because what you've just said about domestic violence can't possibly be right. Therefore, I'm erasing the rest of the film out of my mind. I think that's what we should probably avoiding. That may actually be be be, be uh, right. It may be that most people would have reacted in that way. I don't know. I imagine that's why she took that course. That's certainly a possibility, but I mean, that's also assuming that she knew about it and chose not to report on it. Uh, and, well, yeah. The, 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 and second, the other issue is is that just because we have scientific fact to back this up doesn't mean that people necessarily um, see that as an authority on the figure. The thing that she really displayed in the film is that people often react emotionally rather than logically about these mm -hmm. issues. And her goal wasn't to destroy feminism. Her goal was to show that this existed and why. Mm, yes. I think that not enough people have read your book yet, Steve. I think people don't know. You know, Cassie was working with the material that she had from the interviews she took. And if it had been said, she may well have included it. Um, well, well, yes, but if, if, if you look at the our charity here, Mankind Initiative, uh, one of the people on their board is one of the authors of the seminal research showing that, as I say, that there's a series of experiments done. Uh, Anne Campbell and uh, forgot the other woman's name, um, Catherine Cross, uh, two key researchers in, in, in Britain, two female key researchers in Britain on intimate partner violence. And it's their series of experiments that show that in a couple contexts, the preferred mode of aggression by females, girls and women, is physical violence and in complete contrast, mainly in any situation where a female will be a target, they have an inbuilt aversion towards expressing aggression in a physically violent form. And we know separately, both in both men and women, what the as a three tier neural pathway in males it is inhibition this is concretely found and we know the neurohormonal pathway involving oxytocin which produces this in women the pair bond hormone produces domestic violence in women it does not produce it in males this is clear cut as things get now given that catherine is actually on the board of mankind initiative but mankind initiative is still coming out with the, the merely headline stats that okay yeah one one in three uh are, victims are male I find that quite astonishing. They are fully aware of this research and they're not doing anything with it. And I find that hard to believe. That's very surprising. I didn't realize. I, th I think I've skipped something there though. They're aware of uh, Catherine Ann's research, which shows the behavior and the inferred cognition. What they probably haven't put it together with, which is why I, I research and write all this stuff across this money, they may well not be aware of the research uh, uncovering all the neurohormonal mechanisms. The two together are absolutely killers. And of course, when you put them together with the other lines of evidence, you know, the, the expected uh, massive preponderance of female injury, 20 to one as calculated, uh, and in actual fact it's near parity or slightly more injured women. If you put all these um, uh, lines of evidence together, it's absolutely incontrovertible that the feminist uh, model of understanding and the general understanding of domestic violence is way, way off of, of being. Why MRAs are not going, and I take issue massively with AVFM on this, why the hell is AVFM of all people not running with this? Because they're, they're coming from this uh, ideology of humanism and they, they don't buy into the biology, they don't understand the relationship between biology and uh, that, that, that culture is an expression, it's part of biology, it's not something separate from it and go off the novel trajectory. They're bought into the very basis of arguments that they're actually trying to argue against. They're wondering why they're not necessarily succeeding. I, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not knocking uh, MRIs, MRIs generally, uh, I mean, they're, they're doing, I think, a pretty good job and, and, and trying, trying hard, obviously, and, and their heart's in the right place, clearly. But people need to, if they don't, uh, get to grips with this biology and start disseminating. I think ultimately we're not going to get anywhere. That's my view. Well, you know, I remember once that I tried to explain to a couple of people um, that the brain is just a series of neurons and synapses that are just passing chemicals back and forth to each other. And this is responsible for what we call consciousness and memories and 
you know, everything else that our body can do. And that the people I told it to just didn't believe it. They're like, no, no, there has to be more than that. And I'm like, no, that's that's what our brain is. And yeah, I can uh, understand. Uh, I can understand that you know some people have difficulty with biology, because I think a part of the problem. And I'm not saying this is what AVFM does. I don't comment on what they do because I know nothing really about them. But I think people as a whole tend to reject biology because they want to believe that they themselves are in control of all aspects of their life and not this idea that um, there's some sort of biological drive within them that causes them or some sort of hormones that causes this. I mean, even women get offended when they start acting bitchy one day and it's like, oh, it must be she's on her period. Uh, it must be all the hormones. Or even pregnant women, when they get unreasonable, like, oh, it must be the uh, hormones from the pregnancy. They get angry with you if you try to say that, even though it's probably true. Mm. People well, are scared of biology, and I think that's part of the opposition that you're facing. Yeah, well, I think I think the answer to that point, and it's certainly a valid point, I, I agree with you. I think the thing is, uh, you have to start really from the premise that there are whole swathes of people you're never, ever going to get through to on any level on all this because they're too resistant to it. So I think what you do, you go with the considerable other swathes of people who are not anti-science, who do understand that, who could be persuaded, for example, that consciousness is just an epiphenomenon, which clearly it is. Uh, they could understand that culture is just a manifestation of biology. The facility to have culture cannot ever have come into being in the first place if it didn't serve some evolutionary function to, to fine tune and reinforce the biology that gave rise to it. These are not that difficult concepts. Certainly somebody, anybody who has a universe, university level of education can understand. And I think... Oh, so I don't. I don't have a university level education. Yeah, but I'm sure you could. You um, said yourself, think, you didn't really understand isn't, the world. Isn't a university level education a liability in something like this? Don't people go to university to be indoctrinated into feminism and SJW culture? Yeah, of especially course. in. Uh, I think you'll America. have more luck with the man on the street. Well, and, you know, I can appreciate what you're saying about the biology and that we should be pushing that a lot harder. And I definitely agree with you on that. But I think the way to allow that to happen is we need to go to the masses and tell them um, the news media has been lying to you. Feminism has been lying to you. And not just that they're lying in, you know, like you should believe me now, but to show how they've been lying. Yeah. Um, show like, you know, if they say, oh, well, men don't experience domestic violence. Okay, let's show all these men who've experienced domestic violence. Clearly, the feminists are lying about this because we have all of this here, actual people. We can put a face to it saying, yes, this person experienced domestic violence from a woman. Or, you know, the issue of custody court cases where men are not getting access to their children and they want to be in their children's lives. We have yeah, this belief that, well, men just don't want to have anything to do with their children. That's why they're not a part of their lives. No, it's actually because they're not allowed to be around their yeah, children. But, yeah, you can go so far with that, obviously, and obviously it's important. But all you'll get in response from most people, not just feminists, are you doing what, quote, me tooism? Uh, yes, okay, we can see there's a problem there. But it's a minority problem compared to the majority problem, which is that experienced by females. You'll never get people to change that line. Uh, I'm saying you have to be much more radical about it and get underneath all that to, to, to change them. I think that's, that, that, that's, that's the issue, really. Well, if people are not going to change their mind about it for one thing, why would they necessarily do it for the other? <clears throat> I'm just saying that it's, it's, a, it's a blind alley as soon as you allow them the get out of saying, ah, oh, it's just me too, you, you, uh, you, you, you're saying you put in a series of anecdotes, so, but but we understand that we've been told and seems to fit in with everything we know that uh, this is mostly a women's problem and you can tack on a man's problem as well, but it's secondary. 
you're never going to break that i don't think by any any endless number of examples people still believe it's a minority problem you need to upend it completely there was a study in i think it was either the 80s or the 90s and i'm sure you're familiar with this that looked at families that were had father in the home and fathers not in the home and what they found is that families without a father in the home um, the children often turned to crime. They often uh, did poor in school. They often had a lot of social problems. And that the study concluded that a balanced home with a mother and father was the best option for a child. Now, we've known about this for at least 20 years, and yet nothing has really changed. We still have a preponderance in divorce cases and child custody cases that automatically go to the mother no matter what. And the idea of shared parenting is so offensive to feminists that they will fight it tooth and nail if we even suggest that we should have shared parenting custody or giving all you know, the rights of the child to the mother and that all a father can ever really do is pay. We know about this. We know about the scientific backing of it. And even with your book, you've opened up that there is a biological explanation for a lot of this stuff. People are more likely to turn a blind eye to the scientific explanation to things over their emotional connection to it. And I agree with you. We need to get the science out there. We really need to push it out there. But in order for people to absorb it, we've got to attack them on their emotions first. We've got to get them to open their hearts up that a man can be a victim first. And if they then accept, okay, a man can be a victim, how is this possible? That's where the science comes in. Yeah, and this is why I keep banging on about intimate partner violence. That is a crucial thing, because that's a clear case. I mean, it can't be a more clear-cut instance of victimization than being on the receiving end of physical violence. If we can get through that the feminist angle has got it upside down, everything else will fall like a pack of cards. The, 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 the mother-father thing is, is much more complex, because there's a deep history what, what, I don't know what it was called in the States, but in, in England it's called uh, the Tender Years Doctrine. It goes back centuries. Yeah. That, uh, even in the 18th century, what Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, supposedly the first feminist, argued about, you know, obviously she was from a, a very privileged upper class background. And what she didn't understand is the whole setup was to benefit the majority of women, that men were forced to take uh, responsibility for, for their children, whatever the circumstances. And this is why, in some cases, despite the Tender Years Doctrine, uh, men rather than their wives ended up with the custody of, 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 of the kids. But this is, is, this is very deep-seated stuff. And of course, the, the, the problem there is, is, um, is it's actually quite mixed, the evidence of impact of father absence. And if you, you go to uh, a lot of um, uh, evolution biologists, evolution anthropologists, like Rebecca Sear here in, in Britain, Oh, I have uh, quite a few Barneys with, but still. Um, and she she's uh, done review research and showing that if you look at, um, you know, ancest what the nearest thing to an, to an ancestral situation, i.e. tribal, uh, you know, hunter-gatherer foraging communities in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and you find that uh, there is virtually no difference you can actually detect uh, w whether fathers are actually there, there or not in those traditional communities because they don't rely on, on uh, male provisioning. So, um, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's one of the more complicated things to get at. This is trying to appeal to people about uh, fathers. It's much easier to get at people actually of a domestic violence thing, which is why I think that's what you need to put. Uh, Elizabeth, you want to comment? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the difference between those kind of traditional societies and a modern society where you've got father absence is that you're still going to have masculine role models and masculine input in a traditional society, aren't you? Uh, yes, the, the problem is, is with all this, uh, the, the, the really central book on all this uh, is a book called The Nurture Assumption written by Judith Rich Harris. Before she wrote that, she spent 30 years 
uh, as, as a writer of textbooks on developmental psychology. And her overall conclusion, and this is as cast iron as things get, the more abused, is that uh, what your parents do for you uh, has virtually nil impact on personality and outcomes of the kids, because all socialization virtually is done within the peer group. Uh, you have to be a particularly bad parent to have any negative adult effects on the outcome uh, of your offspring. Now, this, this, I mean, this, this is, uh, you know, this is the world authority on all this stuff, really. And again, if you start, you start, it's one of these strands that makes makes it much more complicated to make arguments about uh, father absence, about impact of, you know, I agree. I think the the, the problems of evidence shows that in a culture which actively promotes that out of single parenthood, you are stacking up problems to yourselves. And you could argue in some respects as absence of male role models and you generate a culture of, of dysfunction. I think that, you know, that clearly happens. But to what extent you can really argue that, uh, it, it, there are serious difficulties. That's what I'm saying. And again, that's why I think you need to, to, to focus on the things where it's clear cut and domestic violence could not be more clear cut. Well, let me put another thing for you. And this is a great annoyance of mine. I hate when people misuse words and it actually makes them sound like idiots. Um, but the problem is, is that it's now common speak that they don't sound like idiots to each other. Um, and this is especially true of like creationism debate, which I really don't want to get into today. <laughs> but um, it's, well, it's just a theory. It's not fact. And it's like, you moron, a theory means it's fact. It's a predictive model, you ah. I also get annoyed when people, it's like, well, dogs aren't sentient. Humans are sentient. No, both dogs and humans are sentient. You morons, you're thinking Certainly. of the word sapient. So, yeah. I mean, that's why, you know, I make this big push about, you know, appealing to people's emotions, forcing them to open up about that. Because, like I said, they're more likely to turn a blind eye to the science. The science is out there. The science is saying what we're saying on this channel. And, you know, but yet it is the appeal to emotion that wins out. And I hate that. I hate that I can't just say this is what the fact is. This is the study that has shown that this is true. People don't want that. People want to feel something is true. And when they see a woman, they see a helpless creature that needs help. And if she says that, you know all men are evil, then he's going to believe that because a woman has said it. That's even a problem we have in the men's movement right now is that the people that are taking um, the most validity from, the most being considered like an expert is women. I mean, between me and modern, like I use this point a lot and it makes me sound petty, but it's a valid point. Between me and modern Medusa, she's about to hit 1,000 subscribers, I just hit 500. Mm. She gets a lot more attention for being a woman. And I understand that, you know, sex sells, you know, people want to know what the opinion of a woman well, no, uh, is a man. But the point of the fact is, is that people lead their lives through emotions, not logic. Oh, you, there's a special fact there, isn't there? The point is just like Elizabeth, I mean, the uh, reason why people listen to Elizabeth is she's an anti-feminist who's a woman you know you don't expect that so you, you clearly your 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 opposite number uh, being female is is, is going to get more attention just for that i mean they expect you as a man likely to be uh, to argue in anti-feminist or even mra lines uh, but they don't expect someone like elizabeth or girl rights what you know karen strohan uh, i mean that's why she gets uh, so much attention. and indeed cassie who, who made the film. That's, the whole point of that film, really, is that it's it's a woman, an attractive woman, an attractive woman feminist, initially, who made the film. That film would not uh, wash it as it does now if if you or I had made it, It'd just be just because we're males. And that is so, definitely true as well, yeah. because there is... So that's, that's not to, that's not to do, so that's not to do with... Uh, obviously, there's obviously that factor as well, but crucially, the, the, the factor there is not, or certainly not only 
the fact that uh, people have more emotional sympathy with women it, it's just that it's 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 counterintuitive that a woman would be presenting it that's the point and that's why i think women are going to be to the fore of both anti-feminism and mra and i think actually that's quite a good thing i don't mind at all if women i are don't mind it either but it is the truth it is mm -hmm. the ugly truth yeah. that we have i mean for example is, is elizabeth uh, was Elizabeth was there with me on the panel at Manchester after the screening of the film, and uh, Natty uh, was this, this young woman under thirty, a young and woman under thirty was was the chair, and she very successfully laid into the feminists feminist in the audience and sent them packing in a way that no guy easily could. And she defused them and then he, he, at times, and she confronted them and slapped them down at times, and was very effective doing it. And we need these people. We need these women. Yes. No, I agree with that. And, you know, I bring that up not as to say we don't need women in the movement or women shouldn't be in the movement. We need everyone in the movement. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the thing that I always say is that the biggest problem with all of this, you know, that there's an underlying current, you know, we can't just look at the problem surface and try to solve them on the surface. And I think this is where you're coming from as well, is we need to look at the undercurrent that connects it all. And, yeah. you know, something I kind of got from your book to help confirm a belief that I have is that the problem we have in just human beings, period, is that men and women care about a woman, but don't really care about a man. This is a key thing in the film. It was it. Um, uh, one of the guys behind AVFM, I think, is one of the most striking things. Is look, the problem here is, is that people don't view men as human beings. Yeah. And I, that was, yeah, that was that was the most powerful. That was yeah, Pauline. That was the most powerful statement in the film, and he's he hit the nail on the head. I think. Yeah, mm. and if we're going to ever have a chance to you know, get men to be recognized for the lack of rights they have. We need to get people to see them as human. We need to get yeah. people to care about what happens to men. And, you know, talking about documentaries here, um, I believe his name is Mal Amal. I've had him on the show. Uh, he's doing a documentary on domestic violence, male domestic wow. violence, male victims, because he was a victim of domestic violence. He lived with a woman for a year and she almost killed him i mean he was once bloody from an abuse that she laid in on him and then he was still scared of getting blood anywhere he was just like and it's such a powerful story and something that needs to be told and yet when he tried to get funding for it i mean i tried to do what i can to promote it but it basically got nothing but cassie J who definitely deserves the accolade she deserves. And I want to put that out there. You know, all these women that are doing this, they deserve the accolades they get. But it was easier for people to donate to Cassie J being a woman doing a movie about the men's movement than a man who went through domestic violence himself mm. to get a film about male victims of domestic violence. And that is just the reality and that is something that we need to work on we need to get people to see men as human beings yeah and but but the point is first of all if you can get the Cassis and the elizabeths and the karen strawns of this world uh, to actually get this anti-feminist message you then produce the bedrock on which men then can start to get funding to produce documentaries on domestic yeah. violence and then we can introduce the actual science and force people yeah. to confront the science. That's right, yeah. Apart from a few mavericks like me trying to get the science out before <laughs> before people are ready, I suppose. Well, no, that's a good thing to do, though. It is well, somebody, to show that to the science it. has been there this whole time mm. and that there's this whole long backlog of information that people have chose to ignore. So when they finally open up, and this is what we kind of call the red pill effect, is when you open up and you actually see it. I and mean, I've had a number of ex-feminists tell me that when they started to look at everything, they were amazed by what they found. And were like, feminists were lying all of these years. This information is present.
Yeah. Okay. And what you're doing is so vital to that. Yeah. The, the, there's, there's two approaches here, isn't there? My approach is, is, is to look at the model of, you know, look at the side of thinking, right, well, there are opinion formers, there are influential people, or quite a small proportion of the population. If you can sort of get access to them and persuade them, uh, is that a more effective model than actually uh, going through the internet and appealing to, you know, a mass of people and a proportion of those actually going to take it on board. Obviously, we need both. Uh, so what I'm doing is a former, and what you and Elizabeth are doing are more the latter, I suppose, really. Mm -hmm. And I think we need both, and hopefully both both yeah. come together. I mean, you know, my book's not going to appeal to, uh, you know, some lowest common denominator or the average person, really. But it, but it is going to sort of cross the path to some extent of people who are like this sort of person who, who is au fait with things like signs and things and in some ways are opinion formers so yeah with your book what i'm hoping is that those who can do something in a position of power or in a position of academia can look at the uh, research that you present and it's like okay we need to change the way that we're teaching. We need to change the way we're spending money. And that's what well, I think is the benefit of your book, is that once we can open up the world to it, it's like, oh, here's an explanation here that really explains things. We need to start focusing on what this book presents to us. Well, my, my main, what, why I started on this in the first place, really, I mean, I'm in touch with quite a few researchers around the world, World of science is so atomized, people in sub, sub, sub disciplines, you know, in their little micro worlds. Uh, and a lot of them are influenced, quite, are affected quite badly by the politics of funding and the policies of PC universities, which means they have to angle things and, and not say things and not do certain studies, etc. Uh, if you can present in the round, connected up all across, uh, you know, different phenomena in human sociality. So people say, oh, I, ah, yes, I'm working on dominance hierarchy. Oh, I'm sort of it that way. Yes, it just fit with this. Oh, yes, we can talk about that. For example, Stephen Kushner is a researcher I'm in, I'm in touch with. And uh, they've discovered, you know, that, that dominance hierarchy proper is male only in an animal model. It, it is not something that females possess. This is absolutely foundational. I'll discuss it in my book. Uh, so actually putting that together with other things means that other people in other disciplines looking at other topics can actually think, well, hang on, this isn't beyond the pale. This isn't, this is not something in my, uh, you know, anti diluvian you know, Neanderthal <laughs> political uh, uh, residue that actually this is, this is something I can actually look into and I should consider this. You know, just, just putting those sort of uh, germs of thinking in people's minds uh, is enough really to, to actually, um, you know, start to get some sort of change. Ah, we've got um, our, your, your, your co-presenter has appeared. Hello. Hello. Oh, you're looking lovely, uh, modern Medusa. Um, I try. <laughs> <laughs> How are you guys um, doing? I'm doing great. Um, Steve seems to be having fun. I don't know about um, Elizabeth. <laughs> she seems rather silent. <laughs> Excuse Elizabeth, please. Uh, well, 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 let me ask you this, Elizabeth. Um, we've basically talked about the woman's role in the men's movement and in society as a whole. And you being an anti-feminist, how do you feel when we talk about that? What is your opinion? Sorry, is that to me or is that to Vanessa? To you, Elizabeth. To you. To me. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, my experience, it echoes yours, Chris, um, which is basically that as a woman, I can put out kind of material that's less good than the material put out by men and get far more attention for it, which makes me feel very uncomfortable. But, mm -hmm. you know, when I do, I have to accept that and try and do what I can with it, try and use it. Same. <laughs> mm. Yeah, and... and so you know, Steve's book is great for someone like me. It's just so so full of information and so mm -hmm. full of studies, and you know, I need to go through it and pull all the 
sort of strings out and start presenting it to people in easily digestible, non-threatening manners. Like I used to do on Facebook? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I ever told you, Steve, but I used to take little snippets of your book and post it on Facebook for people to read because it was just so powerful. And it's like, like the new one, the new one, the old one, the, the new one or the old one. Um, I think it's the, the new one. one. Oh, the new one, right? Oh, uh, the sex differences. Yeah. Yeah. The woman racket's fantastic, though. The woman racket was the first kind of anti-feminist text I ever read, actually. And have you not read the? Was... Have you not read Warren Farrell's Myth of Male Power before? No, not before. No. All oh, right. Oh. You were you were my first. Good luck. Um, <laughs> and I still go back to it. I went back to it the other day. I, I went back, in fact, and I read the first three chapters and recorded them for a friend who is planning some videos on cultural Marxism oh, and PC. The guy who, who's going to email me, yes. Pedro. Pedro. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. The first, the first chapter, of course. That was heavily bashed about. I had a big argument with my editor about it. So it, it's not very coherent. It was the first, you know, political overview. That's the worst part of the book, I think, really. But so, but it's a lot more sorted out now in the new <laughs> book and, 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 and me paper on the identity politics, of course. The that, thing that about the, the woman racket is, though, Chris, uh, sorry, Mad Cat, that it is uh, much more accessible. It is, yeah. It's a much easier read, and if I'm not mistaken, you're going to go back to Sex Differences Explained and present that in a similar format, right? That's right, yeah. I, I mean, not, uh, not, not, not immediately, but um, uh, because, uh, well, I'm going to wait two or three years probably, because I've, I've got quite a few papers to work on, but definitely, my mean, next book project will definitely be a genuinely, quote, popular yeah, attempt, as much as I'm able to do. A, a popular read, and I'll try and make it simpler even than the woman racket. So it's, uh, I mean, the woman racket was uh, generally went down all right, but, but a lot. Some people did comment that uh, it was difficult in places. So I'm, I'm probably going to work with someone, not just me, work with someone to actually simplify and simplify the text to, to actually put it across more easily. So let's talk a little bit more about the red pill film because. Yeah. Uh, I want to keep getting that out there because, you know, with everything that we're talking about, the best, th this is a really great tool we have right now. It's like we've been talking about this ad nauseum, and now we actually have a film out there that we can um, say, hey, go watch this film. You know, don't, don't, you don't listen to me. Just go watch this film, you know. So we really need to push that out there, and I think – I guess the question that I want to ask to all of you is what do you think is the next step from here? You know, now we have the film, now it's available for people to download and purchase. Um, do we take the film and keep showing it as much as we can, or do we take it another step further? Well, what's the next step from here? Elizabeth? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I think we need to get it out to as many people as possible. And I mean, the next step for me, you know, is working on my own videos or our own videos with the Liberty Bells and Studio Brule. And also we are um, campaigning hard at the Liberty Bells as part of our side project called um, Ladies for Philip Davies. At the moment, we're campaigning to get the Women and Equalities Committee changed to just the equalities committee um, thinking oh, i announced to them the other day well i think the next step i think we've already got haven't we really i mean if you'd seen the red pill um and then you went on youtube and you found uh, bill bill burr comedian talking about it he's uh, brilliant at, at it those videos and oh, oh, karen strawn is probably my favorite uh, in terms of anti-feminism or MRA, I think uh, you know the natural thing now is to go on YouTube and look this stuff up. So I think those resources are already there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, it, it, I think it's just natural. I think uh, 
uh, what, what's not there, of course, is, uh, as I said, is, is the science. But that's another strand. But I think the actual next step, the natural obvious next step, is is is, is there. And uh, there's pro probably already too many resources for people to actually. I mean, if if you know, if I spend a couple of hours just just going through you know a YouTube chain, you know, I mean, when it invites you to look at things, and I thought, where does this end? It doesn't. There's, there's huge amounts of stuff out there. I mean, j just looking at all the Bill Burr comedy. Have you seen this stuff? It's absolutely hilarious on feminism. And I have. He, I love him. He's he's done more for anti-feminism. Anti yeah, I think he's probably done more for anti-feminism than virtually anybody else, because he's, yeah. he's he's a popular guy, and and you can watch these endlessly, and uh, you can see all the women in the audience responding. They know full well that he's he's absolutely bang on on every point. I mean, the great one yeah, about the... domestic violence, and he, and he and he says you shouldn't hit a woman. And said, well, yeah, but I says what? There's no reason, no reason. You know, I can think of nine reasons. You know, before I get up, you know, and, and it, it's just absolutely, it just completely inverts the whole thing at every, every juncture. And uh, you know, you get I paid more I... than me. You get more paid than me. You know, I'll tell you why. That there's, uh, you know, because when when it comes to ship going down like the Titanic, for some deep fucked up historical reason, you and the kids get to leave, and I just say, what about me? You know, <laughs> and it's it's great stuff. I think yeah, um, we review one speaking of videos on, on our stream, Madcap. What's up? On the Valentine's Day stream, didn't we re review his uh, a clip of his talking yeah. about yeah about Valentine's Day? It was funny. Yeah, speaking of comedy, I think the other sort of next step is um just sitting back and watching feminists kill each other. To be honest. Oh yeah. Uh, that's yeah. another great. You can spend day, hours and hours, days and days, looking at major feminist fails. The I mean, you just type in "feminist fail" YouTube. You're just overloaded with stuff. I mean, people are just making. Fun. This is the way to kill feminism. Laugh it out of town. So, what about you, Vanessa? What do you think is with the red pill being out? What's the next step from here? Comedy film. Um. <laughs> well, besides like. The video or the movie itself like i guess um you know once everybody's once everybody knows about it the next step after that would be to just keep pu pushing the issues that she highlighted in the film uh you know all everything that's that's going on with men right now that needs support and then you know getting people to finally recognize it especially women <laughs> so that they start, um, you know, instead of instead of making men so disposable and uh, acting like uh, women are basically goddesses among everybody else, and, and uh, you know, with the women and children, that's all, <laughs> that's all anybody cares about. But once you you know, once you see what's going on in like, in the red pill. It's like, wow, okay, yeah, men actually have problems, and they're kind of getting fucked up a lot, even if anybody wants to try and help. So it's like, you know, after, once everybody, or once everybody at least tries to express that, whether they, whether feminists deny it or not, um, I think at least some people would try to um, move forward and gain uh you know whatever kind of support these men's rising men's groups need if you know what i mean <laughs> now about um do you think uh, milo is going to get easily get crowdfunding to produce a film milo's film feminism is cancer i can see that <laughs> that would be amazing <laughs> possibly not now sorry I would possibly, I think possibly not, not oh, now oh, I, th I think he'll recover from that quite easily yeah, he you will. Yeah. He's 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 he'll survive that quite easily. I mean, it's 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 a misrepresentation trying to make out that he's supporting paedophilia. It's a it's a classic one, and it'll get around that very. I mean, he's got he's already got somebody to put his book. You know, he got the sponsorship for his the publisher of his book pulled out, but he's got an e deal to get the book out. So it'll it'll uh, it'll just lie low relatively for a little bit. It'll come back. But I I think uh, Milo has been a great. Um, ambassador for anti-feminism and, yes and, and yeah. no. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree, yeah. yes, and, and and in the same way, of course, it, uh, it's, it, he calls himself a dangerous faggot. Is is that uh, his capital yeah. is uh, is being the homosexual again? He's he's not a straight male white guy. Um, mm. so that, that's, that he's, he's played on that. But you know, again, we just accept. You know, he, he's been great for us, really. But uh, I I agree with Chris. Yeah, I it's, have uh, a big issue with it's, him. It's, Yes, there are some problems with that. I, I, my issue is with his stance on circumcision. Yeah. Yes. Um, but you know, that's the key thing right there. And this is something that we all need to be open to is that not all of us are going to agree on every single issue with each other yeah. on. So we've got to be open to that. And that's the problem in feminism. And there was an interview with Andy um, Warski with an ex-feminist, and she was saying it's like if she had any dissenting viewpoint, even just like asked a question, she was immediately, um, you know, hated upon. She was immediately yeah. turned down. It's mm -hmm. like, well, you're just a hateful misogynist. You're just a hateful um, homophobe. For just yeah. even asking a question, and, and this there, group, there is got to be open that we all think differently. But, yeah, I mean that's not really um, uh, that's not been a problem so much with certainly not anti-feminism. There's a little bit of a problem in MRA. I mean, I have um, uh, a, a few people who try and sort of cyber stalk me who reckon I'm a feminist. You know, some extreme yeah. weirdo MRI guys who say, uh, "Oh, you you you're supporting." You're not properly attacking gynocentrism, and I think you know what planet are you on, mate? You know, <laughs> uh, 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 it's a little bit to, uh, uh, to ban people from a, from a stream before. So, so there are some one or two nutters out there, but generally, the, the, I've not really discovered any any particular topic area where there's any uh, sort of disagreements in in anti-feminism or MRA circles. I don't think, including, I mean, obviously, as I pointed out, Milo. Uh, on circumcision, I've, I've not met many guys who take issue uh, with with the with the line. But look, hang on, MGM, FGM, they're basically the same thing. I, I don't think there's anybody anti-feminism yeah. or MRA, with very few exceptions, that take any other line. And th so there's no other topic, I don't think. There is, the one that, actually. There is. There is. Oh, yep. Yeah. What um, was that? The biggest. The biggest issues right now is between um, the men's rights activists. And tradcons or traditional traditional conservatives, and right. MRAs and MGTOW, and it seems to be right. two extremes that the MRAs really don't want to go down. The tradcons are like everything should return back the way it was a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, no, because men still suffered during that time. That's right. And the MGTOW are like. All women are the enemy. We should do away with them. And it's like, okay, you've now basically become the feminist that we hate. Precisely, yeah. yeah. So there are those issues going on that technically they're all under the same umbrella of men's rights. Yeah. But we have drastic views on how things should be run. Yeah. And of course, but I mean, I've, I've had discussions with some MGTOWs. The, the less extreme ones, and, and they're just saying, well, uh, there's a difference between saying, well, given my circumstances, you know, I'm, I'm better off, you know, living life on my own, blah, blah, blah. Then you've got the ideological MGTOWs who, who, who are like separatist feminists, I think. They, they seem to be, um, they're pretty small minorities, aren't they? Yeah, Mig um, Fiedelbogen calls them MGTOW sectarians. Good. <laughs> kind of distinction to make because you know MGTOW in theory is fine by me you know and there are even married MGTOWs you know yeah have clear boundaries well I want to men with clear boundaries I want to kind of change the topic a little bit yeah there's something recent within the news and given your background I wanted to get your uh, opinion on it um, very recently um, the state government of Tennessee has passed a bill. Um, this is just on the Senate. I think it's still waiting for a final approval to become um, a legal precedence of considering porn a public health hazard. 
<laughs> um, the idea is, is that while this bill is not saying that it's illegal yet, but they could go down that road eventually. They want to educate people on why porn is bad. Now, the reason why they're doing this, the official reason, because they're mostly conservatives who hate porn, but the official reason is because men are not marrying anymore, that the rate of marriage is at a decline, the rate of children being born is at a drastic decline. Yeah, that's definitely and, porn's fault. <laughs> Yeah, and they're saying that because people are watching porn, um, they don't have an appreciation for women, and that's why they're not marrying. Yes, and I ridiculous. wanted to ask you, do you think there's any validity to that, that porn is a detriment to society? It's absolute rubbish. The, the, the idea that, uh, I mean, uh, go, just look at the general thing about, uh, I always think men have got like a split vein, effectively. I mean, as a male, I know, that I want a, a you know, long-term loving relationship with a, with a partner. At the same time, ideally, you know, I'd, I'd like sex with lots of nice young newbar females, and I want both at the same time. And being happy and satiated in one has no effect at all on being happy and satiated on the other. So anybody who uses porn as a, an alternative to say, you know, accessing escort or something, you know, the idea that, that is somehow some impediment in forming a long-term liberal relationship is the height of ridiculousness. You know, there's nothing to it. But of course, we've been here in much more extreme form before. The Andrew Dworkin line, which is quite successful in Canada, I think, if I'm, I'm right in saying, more so than, than the States. Uh, and who's their partner in crime? McKinnon, wasn't it? Uh, and they right. argued, they argued that uh, porn, of course, which is the majority term because it should be called male erotica, you know, female erotica, you know, Fifty Shades, nobody argues about that. Uh, their, their idea is that it was, it should be classed as violence against women, you know. Well, that didn't really get very far in American statutes, and I don't think that far in kit. They, they were successful to some extent for a time, but I think that's been pushed back successfully now. So this, what Chris just talked about now, is 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 pretty much, as you say, it's, it's less anyway from an extreme feminist camp than from paleoconservatives, isn't it, really? Yeah. And paleoconservatives aren't really going that that far forward. I mean, if you look at what Trump's about, um, I don't. Yeah, you know, I think the whole Tea Party thing is is, is taking a retreat now. It, this that's this. What's going on now is anti-establishment, and of course, the economics is actually quite politically left anyway. So I think we've we're in a lucky situation now where we're seeing the retreat of not only extreme feminism. Uh, penetrated into the public discourse to the point of actually getting legislative changes. That's on the retreat. I think also paleoconservatism is also on the retreat. So I, I think w w things are looking actually quite rosy. So I don't expect anywhere, not even the States, any anti-porn stuff getting very far. We on the other hand, there are signs that some extremes, I mean, there have been major pushes in the EU and even in bits of the UK to try and outlaw prostitution. It's been outlawed recently in Northern Ireland. I think we're at peak feminazism really on, on things like that now. Uh, I think that's just the oil tanker that's actually been taking a while to slow down before it's pushed into reverse. I don't think we're going to see much more of that. But hang on, I, didn't Theresa May recently um, ban porn from being shown in the UK? like um female ejaculation and spanking various things like that uh, i can't remember I, I mean theresa may is a big problem uh, she's a real idiot identity, identity politics nutter an extreme feminist uh, people don't seem to realize that and we're quite unfortunate to have as pm so yes the, the, the could the could be further i mean she's very very vocal on domestic violence as a women's issue for example i mean they've just put in an extra 20 million pounds to, yeah. to places like refuge and no mention of any of the debates about men at all um but i go around sheffield and i see uh, i don't see any domestic violence posters which don't mention men in fact there are ones that explicitly it's domestic violence it's, 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 don't forget men are victims too type posters so we, we're getting some uh, some movement in our direction there at you know pavement level even in you know posters in you know really right on advice center places uh, focus focusing on men in domestic violence 
So, yeah, okay, this, it's the usual thing, you know, uh, uh, one step forward, one step back, you know, but I think generally. So I think what Chris is alluding to, this porn thing, I don't think we should see that much danger. From it. And, of course, the other thing is, the other way of looking at this, in as much as these do pose dangers and people pass stupid laws, it actually helps us. It helps to uh, get feminism left out of town. You know, these, these crazy things are happening. Like in Britain at the moment, this massive witch hunt against supposed paedophiles, you know, through a complete misapprehension of what paedophilia is. They're not paedophiles, they're people who, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, not, not, not the details about it, but the, that is, is being exposed as a, as a complete ridiculous witch hunt. And uh, so that will bring about a further backlash against feminism. So I, th so I think bring it on, really. Yeah, no, I agree with you on it that. Actually, and it actually it's helps. going to get turned down because it violates the First Amendment of uh, freedom of yeah. speech. Well, but, you've got that in the States, which is really good. We, we yeah. don't have that here. They're and that's a big, a big thing in the States. Yeah. Feminists are trying to outlaw it, which is unfortunate. But I do think you're right. And I think what we're seeing right now is the idiom that an animal is most dangerous when it's injured. And what we're seeing is the death of this conservative mentality that, you know, we need to go back to Christianity and, you know, we need to be back in the 1950s. Not all conservatives are like that, but the staunch ones definitely are. And I think this is where this is coming from. And also feminism, that all men are evil. They're the problem and we're all oppressed, even though they're living better than any man in a third world country. We're seeing the death of these ideologies. And so what they're doing is they're doubling down, tripling down, and doing as much as they can to try to hold on to it. Exactly. And yeah. they're actually are making it worse for themselves yeah. and helping to destroy themselves a lot faster. You put it in a nutshell. Absolutely right. <clears throat> You've been silent, Vanessa. You got any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you put it very well. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I mean, it's not just men who like porn. Everybody likes porn. And if they don't, that's their preference. And it's like, why? I mean, unless you have like an actual problem, like, Personally, I don't think you necessarily have a problem unless you're, like, ignoring having sex with your spouse to go straight to porn. In that case, you need to go and, like, you know, go to a therapist. But it's, like, obviously there's not the reason why, you know, so many men are not... Whatever. It's the same reason with... I mean, it's not the same reason, but women aren't getting married because... because uh, you know, stuck up bitches, and, and and I mean, there's lots of different reasons, but that's you know, two general <laughs> reasons. With the porn in the in the UK, what's there's interesting developments now? Uh, it was a few days ago, wasn't it, Elizabeth? The, the um, some police chief. In fact, wasn't the the guy in charge of looking at this stuff in, in across the UK? I can't remember. And he said that they are now moving to uh, stopping uh, charging. Uh, most men who, who actually are caught viewing uh, illegal porn, underage porn, because there's, they reckon there are so many men in the UK accessing this that they'd have to sort of virtually build four times the number of prisons we've got now to actually house them all. Now, the undercurrent of this, of course, is, is that and people are waking up to this. What's happening is, is that this is the latest way the police fit, fit guys up. Because uh, anybody knows uh, about porn sites, if you go onto any porn site and you click on an image you actually want to see, a whole page comes up of thumbnails, which bear no resemblance whatsoever to the picture. Now, if the police uh, want to fix something, they go in, nick the computer. Oh, all these images which you've downloaded. Have you buggery? You've not done anything. They've just popped up and uh, you've closed them down and gone to something else. But hey, the police reckon you've got 10,000 uh, illegal pics of underage girls. Now, uh, this is what's happening. And, of course, the police are completely inundated 
with with all the work involved in this and people are, are wising up to the fact that this is is, is is one big witch hunt and again it's part and parcel of of, of, of the implosion that's just around the corner not of course saying that we condone this but you know it is definitely true that it's just it's almost impossible to know an image that we look at hey she looks like she's 21 oh my god she's actually 14 it's like yeah, yeah. Uh, but, how was i supposed to know that I, i'm not even, I'm not even talking that about that, that. They we're all 21. i'm not talking about that i'm talking about um, when you when, about. when you click on an image and you get a page full of thumbnails and some of those thumbnails, for all you know, may be of underage girls. You know, I've known. You don't, you're not clicking on those. You're clicking away from that. But right. in the brief second that's been on, that's on your computer. That'll be classed by the police as a download. You can have 10, 20,000 of those. You've never looked at. You've closed the page down as soon as it's popped up. But technically, uh, you could be prosecuted for that. It's crazy. And that's why the police are now inundated. And and a lot of uh, uh, barristers are going to get wise to this, and, and they're going to start challenging all this. And there's going to be a big up uproar. And it's I say there's so many angles on on, on this sort of thing, uh, the excesses of of the law, which are going to get found out fairly soon. Well, the one point that I love to bring up when this discussion comes up, because I like to discuss pornography on this channel, because it's something that needs to be. Um, a part of our culture it is a part of our culture but you know a lot of what i hear from the sex negative feminists out there especially like gail dines um who once again has refused to do an interview with me at all because she considers me too low brow um she says that it's a detriment to society and it hurts women and all of that but it's like when you look at crime statistics, and I believe it's true for the UK, but definitely for the United States, we hit our peak of violent crime in 1992. Mm. And since that time, it has declined. Now, I think it's about coming to a point where it's like um, plateauing off, but it's still much, much lower than it was it's about back sex crime. in 1992. All crime. There's but, quite a so let me let me uh, this final point. But in that time, we had the internet introduced in the United States mainstream in 1993, and of course, porn soared. Now, I'm not saying that porn is what caused crime to go down, but if porn was really as bad as all of these sex negative feminists are saying, it must be yeah. then we would have seen more of an effect from crime as a whole and yet we are seeing it as a decline even rape has been on a drastic decline yeah. since that time okay go with your point that's that's exactly right yeah uh, there have been quite a number of statistical studies looking at the relationship between uh, porn also whether prostitution is is repressed or it's allowed to flourish uh, and in both cases if you try and relate it to, to sexual assault rape generally uh, there's 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 no relationship or an inverse relationship. So uh, the, fe the feminists have got zero, ev literally zero evidence and plenty of evidence against for the case. They're going to get nowhere on that one. And it, once again, it comes to that they're using their emotions and not logic to dictate their policies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the argument is just the same one as some people still stupidly use. Oh, don't give boys guns because you might grow up and kill people. Well, in actual fact, there's no relationship whatsoever. I mean, I, just like every other kid I know, had guns to play with the kids. I've never handled a gun as an adult and no intention ever of doing so. I mean, the thing is just so stupid that, that everybody... The, the, the most uneducated person knows that it's stupid. The most educated person knows that it's stupid. So many extreme ideologues that run with it. It's going absolutely nowhere. Yeah, and I do think that something like prostitution should be legalized. I was talking to one adult uh, film star who was saying that um, brothels should be more commonplace again, that we should have them in every city. Um, oh, they are in every city. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, if people are, and I, I do think that the access to porn has actually helped with crime. 
I can't prove that, but that's what I believe. Because if people have ways of getting it out of their system, like if they can just go and watch porn and, you know, knock one out of the park, um, they tend to be able to be more productive in life. Even if they're married, you know, they can get that stress out of them instead of doing something, you know, illegal. But, oh, I just lost the point I was about to make. Um, so, if people... There's a moral case, apart from anything else, there's a moral case, actually a moral case, to put for prostitution that would even fit with paleoconservatives. I mean, what is prefer more preferable uh, for somebody to have an affair or somebody to use a sex worker? Well, clearly, if you have an affair you know, or, or one night stand or the various, you know, different d degrees of betraying your partner, it is betraying your partner. Yeah, in a, in a way that could interfere with it in a drastic way. You could get someone pregnant, you oh. could get somebody jealous and come around. If you're using a sex worker, that is a, a disembodied form of sex, which is not, apart from possibly an STD, is not going to rebound on your relationship. So, That's, so you could argue. I remember what I wanted to say. It was like now right. we have this whole abstinence thing that we're trying to teach people to repress their sexual urges and not to have sex with people unless they get married first and it's we're just going in the wrong direction with all of this well that's My absolutely how that many people say for marriage i would want to die <laughs> that i would want to kill myself <laughs> oh she's quite extreme but yeah i mean we Sex is a very powerful force um, in humans' lives. I mean, even if we, like, even Maslow in the need hierarchy put it at level one, that um, the need for sexual release is important for us to be healthy. And if we deny people this, and it's like now Tennessee is trying to um, coerce people. It's like, well, hey, we don't want you to have porn, so if you want to get a sexual release, go get married. Well, I hate to tell you, but the joke in marriage is <laughs> when you get married, you stop having sex. <laughs> so that doesn't really solve the problem there. Back to what I was saying before, the guy's got a split brain. One half wants to be married, the other one wants to screw around, and and you want both. and satiation in one uh, has no effect on satiation in the other that's just a, i mean i'm uh, maybe i'm weird here, but I'm, I'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure i'm speaking for all guys here i mean i don't know any guy who thinks differently i think for the most part if the guy doesn't agree he tends to understand why people feel the way they do yeah All right, so we're coming about to our 90-minute mark. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and end the show here. And I thank um, both of you for coming out. Is there any final thing that you want to remark about the Red Pill movie or anything else we've discussed, uh, starting with you, uh, Steve? Uh, just so before that, I thought it was a great film. I definitely recommend people watch it, uh, irrespective of the fact that they may not learn something from it if they're already well-versed in all the MRA stuff. Because it flows brilliantly. It's a great, it's a classic example, I think, of a genuine journey film. I mean, it's not a fiction. This is a real something that happened. And the change happened while she was making the film. It's not actually contrived, is it? No. This is what's, this is what's really, really good about it. And uh, I think she's so personable. And she's, let's face it, she's gorgeous too, which helps. <laughs> um, and she, uh, the way she interacts with the MRA guys, Pauline and people, is, uh, comes across quite well. Issues, I mean, you know, it, it, it was an absorbing two hours that doesn't flag. I mean, you know, it's, it's highly recommendable, even though I may have some some issues with it. And what about you, Elizabeth? I would just like to say about the red pill please use it as the tool that it is, the fantastic tool that it is, and get it out there to all of your friends and family and start changing minds.
Uh, and now I'm going to go and ruminate on um, what we were talking about about fathers earlier, because I'm not convinced, Steve. I must admit, I think that fathers do have a critical role, and I think um, also that bad, even to quite small degrees, has quite a big potential effect. Mm. Yeah, I'm mm. on that position as well. The father's role is very important, or at least the very least having two different parents. I mean, if you had like a lesbian relationship, so long as a one of them was fulfilling the father-like role, that's far healthier than just a single parent. Mm -hmm. You see, I'm not convinced because there's a book called, oh, what is it called? No, I'm not going to remember. It's by Stephen E. Rhodes. Um, but oh, yeah. he talks yeah. about, yeah, he talks about um, girls particularly needing a biological father in the house and how it suppresses their periods beginning and it suppresses them becoming sexually active and it makes them more responsible and that actually even if there's a man in the house who is raising them those effects aren't there yeah no i agree with you on that i'm just saying that at the very least you need two opposing mm -hmm. um parents that you mm -hmm. can learn and reflect upon but definitely mm -hmm. having a male influence in your life especially in your home I think is paramount, and I do disagree with you on that, Steve. But I, I think Mark I think the way end here, so we can't really get into that. Okay, but go ahead, Steve. Uh, I think the the thing to focus is on 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 you know basic rights. You know, as a father, you should have a very strong right to have access to your kids, and you shouldn't be you know made to pay ridiculous alimony, etc. Et or all, all that's the way to approach there. But um, I mean, the I think you have to go back to ancestry if you look at studies of uh you know tribal life in sub-saharan africa and uh, it's it's the, the women work together to collectively to rear their children and the guys are away hunting or raiding or defending the territory from from raiders uh and that's the evolutionary background so okay maybe we, we've got recent cultural superstructure on this which which is really quite important I'd, but uh, I'm, I'm open-minded about it, but I'd, you know, I think it's a, a bit of a shaky to, to make that as a, as a centerpiece of uh, MRA activity. I think would would, would be risky. But uh, I'm open-minded about it. Well, I would argue that while our ancestors, our great ancestors, may have had behavior like this, that we also need to look at how society has evolved since that time to now in addition to what our ancestors were like and it seems that when we do have a father in the picture that you know having a male model to you know for boys to want to be like and for women on who is a good man to marry you know they say that women marry their fathers and if he's a good man, then it's reasonable that they'll marry a good man. So there is an influence there that seems to have stemmed from society. Well, I said the research shows very differently that um, uh, you are socialized almost exclusively within your peer group. Now, of course, the issue then is where does your peer group get ideas from? Does that get you know, obviously from the older generation to degree? Um, and then also looking back to, uh, you know, traditional societies in Africa, um, maybe because we've compartmentalized into these nuclear families, that people are distant from other males. So it may be that you do need a, a male role model in the family, in our societies, because the other males are too distant. Whereas in a traditional society, kids would see the males around them. They would have a you know collective group of role models. So that might maybe tapping into what you're talking about. Possibly, but that's definitely a discussion for another time. Like I said, yeah. we're right at the end of our show here. But uh, Vanessa, is there any final remarks you want to make on any of this? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, well, I definitely think that... Uh, you know, like Elizabeth said, definitely use it to see um, what's going on. You know, even if you, even if people have 
no idea, you know, if they're on either side, like feminist or they, 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 they've never heard of if any of what's going on, show them the film and, you know, just, you know, it, it, it's a very, very valuable thing to learn from. Um, there's a lot of information in there. I don't even remember all of it. I'll probably watch it a few more times just to, you know, soak all of it in. <laughs> uh, but I definitely think that um, it's very, very informative and powerful and we should, um, you know, show it to everybody that we can. No, I definitely agree that there's just a lot of information there. And, you know, like Steve, you know, I didn't really learn anything from watching it. It just confirmed a lot yeah. of the things I already knew. But I definitely think that it should be watched again and again, guys. It's a really good film. It's a very important film that needed to be made. And I'm glad that it did get made. It's just a mind broadener, I think. <laughs> So let's go ahead and close up. Um, how can um, you, you have a few books out, Steve. Um, can you tell us about those real quick and maybe other ways people might be able to get a hold of you, say like on social media or whatnot? Uh, well, the best way to get in touch with me is to email me. I'm on stevemoxon3 at talktalk.net. <laughs> I'm, I'm still getting used to social media, really. I'm, I'm probably of an age group. <laughs> Unlike Elizabeth, well, you, all you guys, I'm still getting used to. It. I must must get better at it. The books we've already talked about, sex and explaining the woman racket, and I uh, say so any any of you guys out there, two put you don't have to buy the thing. You can go to New Male Studies Journal at their homepage, and the books there uh, as a PDF file. You can uh, read for free. Okay, and Elizabeth, I know that you have the. Uh... Liberty Bell's coming out. Um, also, you write a few articles. Uh, what are some ways people can find you? Well, I suppose the best ways are sort of Twitter or email. So on Twitter, I am at antifembot. That is A-N-T-I-F-E-M-B-O-T. And my email address is antifembot at gmail.com. I love getting emails, so... Get in touch. I forgot to mention my website, of course. So I've got all my papers on there, which I think are more important than my books. And that's just stevemoxon.co.uk. Okay, and Vanessa, you want anything you want to show? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can always follow me on Twitter, at Vanessa W. Cheese, and then my YouTube channel. I'm almost at a 1,000 subscribers, so... Make sure you <laughs> tell people about that. Uh, we're probably going to have a stream uh, next Tuesday on my channel at 1 Eastern time. Actually, so. it's going to be at 9 a.m. Oh, yeah, yeah, 9. <laughs> because we're going to have yeah. some talks about ICMI, the International Conference Men's Issue, uh, with the organizer on Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> and um, let's see, uh, you, you know, donate to my Patreon. Uh, for every $5 donated, I post another sexy GIF on Twitter. So, <laughs> you know, those are always fun. And uh, I have a new store on Rage On, uh, which Rage On is uh, giving me a little bit of copyright issues. Check out my, uh, my new video if you want to <laughs> know what's going on with that. But uh those yeah. bastards. I know. Check that out. And then, uh, you know, my Facebook page, Modern Medusa and Vanessa's Custom Art. I do custom whatever, avatars, t-shirts, all that shit. And guys, I just want to put this out there. I'm a moderator on her pages on uh, Facebook. So if you want to write her dirty messages, I will see it. <laughs> just putting it out there. And all those big <laughs> You'll give them a one out of, or a, a rate out of, rating out of ten. <laughs> two, two, two. <laughs> All right, and for me, I've got a show starting tomorrow. Um, it's going to be at eight p.m. Um, it's just going to be kind of random. Open invite to anyone who wants to come on. Um, just let me know on Twitter if you want to be on there, or message me through YouTube. But 
Twitter is better. Uh, GG Mad underscore Cat. That's in the description box down below. Um, also, next week for Boobs and Dicks, we're also starting at 9 a.m. And we're going to be talking about the state of Australia. State as in the state of things. Not that I think Australia is a state. Just putting that out there. Um, check out my description box down below. Um, consider donating to my Patreon. I am trying to get money to help with my disability, but I also want to get a better computer so I can make better videos so I can earn the money that I make through Patreon. Um, if you're not comfortable with doing Patreon, perfectly understandable. Consider buying my book down below that. The first one is free. The second one, which comes directly after that, is only $2.99. And if you like it, consider leaving me a review because that really helps me out. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Steve, for coming out today. I thoroughly enjoy talking to you. I don't agree with everything you say, but it is a <laughs> lot of fun to have conversations with you, Steve. And Elizabeth, you know I love you, so. <laughs> Good uh, stuff. Thank you, everyone, in the chat today. And uh, this is Dix. And I'm Boobs. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.